I would like to proudly announce that we have uh, some other great people who have journeyed quite far to present to you, um, and that is Ron Thompson and Dr. Yvonne sell me, Kaseng, <laughs> that have come from Mexico. And they'll be talking to us. Uh, we're going to change gears a little bit. Um, you know, believe it or not, my favorite animal isn't the wolf. Uh, my favorite animals are, are the little, the medium species, the coyotes, the martins. So um, I think it's important that we, we include other apex predators in this discussion and how the management differs and maybe some other different things that non thetal is happening. Um, and it sounds from what I've known that seems that Mexico may be quite more progressive than than the United States. Well, with that, I'll take it away. Thank you so much. Thank you for having us. Thank you, Melissa. I want to I want to thank Nancy Warren too for having us here. Nancy, are you all here? Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, we're going to make some analogies today to wolves. Okay, I'm from Arizona, um, where we have the Mexican wolf, of course, and we're dealing with that. Um, that's been the same number for a long time. I managed the pr Blue Primitive Area when I worked for the Arizona Game and Fish Department and um, was with Bruce Babbitt the day they released the first wolf. So I'm quite familiar with wolf restoration attempts. Um, Yvonne's uh, from Mexico City. She's a vet. And she owns and her own business, which is a wildlife um, pharmaceutical um, capture business. So all the capture drugs in Mexico is, are manufactured by her. And she also deals with capture guns, so I kid her that she deals in guns and drugs in Mexico. And after that video, I've had to listen to her, of course, for years about how Mexico is much more progressive than the United States. And in a lot of ways, they are. Their apex carnivores are completely protected. Their bears, their jaguars, their wolves, which are just now reintroducing, and their pumas, their mountain lions, okay? To be able to hunt them, you have to show a sustainable population. And to be able to do that, you have to have a wildlife management unit called an UMA. Most of these are comprised of a ranch or a large management unit, such as an ojito. And once you've pro proven a sustainable number, then you can apply for permits. And Yvonne will go into the jaguar part of it, but I'm just going to talk currently now about mountain lions. We're not, we came here with the one goal, and that was to learn from you, and we've learned a lot. But we also want to leave some ideas with you that we, that we hope um, will start small and grow into something bigger. This is the president's tree. As you know it, it exists in California. It was recently captured for the first time um, in a single photograph. You can Google it. But this is where we hope to go with it. Okay, let's put, keep things in pers perspective. I think we always have to in this day and age. We, we're up, this, we, we come here to become energized. We're speaking to the choir. We know that, okay? There are no really state or federal agencies here that we know of. There's some, some retired people. But um, we've all are, are going down a road that's really, really difficult. And so at times we need to come together and energize ourselves, and that's why we're also here, okay? And that's why Yvonne has traveled so far. Um, this is a pre pretty recent comment from an individual who thinks about um, the creation of the universe. And of course, we know what's happening to our climate uh, on, a, on a daily basis. Um, here's another one that goes with that, with that Stephen Hawking comment, okay? Hey, we're going to have to feed 9 billion people. We just drove across Iowa, and we realized that I think um, Iowa could probably could feed them if they um, could somehow double their land size. It's not going to happen. We know, that, we know the real problem. It's, it's, it's too many people. Yvonne's working on a, a virus now that's going to not allow anybody to reproduce. Um, I believe she's going to come up with it. I'm not going to tell you how. Now here's something more of a, we're starting to narrow in our focus a little bit. Um, can you believe this? They're, they're revamping the, the, and reissuing the recovery plan for the Florida Panther. Um, and, and this is, uh, I think, a very interesting comment. Hey, we want other states to share in the recovery of the Florida Panther. 
Panthers finally left Florida for Georgia a few years ago. And they were able to tell that because of a GPS collar. And North Carolina, they're a little bit behind the, the times, folks. But can you imagine the state wildlife agency declaring, wanting to declare an apex carnivore extinct? That's just thrown in the towel. And then finally, a wolf that wandered in onto the um, North Plateau of Arizona recently, all the way from the Rocky Mountains. Um, and then returned back to Utah and was promptly shot by a coyote hunter. It was also wearing GPS collar. The hunter had a 10 power scope on his rifle when he, when he did that. There just happens to be a bounty now on coyotes in Utah, so those shots are very um, worthwhile. And then I want to end it with a, a, just a, a positive statement, because there are some really positive things happening right now. In Europe, carnivores um, are at a restoration level that's never been seen by a modern um, European man. I mean, they, they are, truly are in really good shape. And we do have animals that are recolonizing North America. The wolf is one, of course. Um, and, of course, the, the puma, uh, which just entered Wisconsin. You're going to have to deal with this animal much quicker than you think, I promise you. Um, once they get here and they see all these deer, they're, gonna, they're, they're really going to be happy here. So they're coming by way of Canada, but I think they're, they're eventually going to um, meet every expectation that I have. Uh, so the topic uh, that I want to cover is I'm going to cover about not some non-lethal methods and uh, what GPS tells us about the diets of pumas, and then Yvonne's going to talk about jaguars, and we're going to make some analogies um, towards wolves. Okay, mountain lions. We know they're the most widely distributed mammal in North America. And Yvonne's going to talk about jaguars, which are um, quickly disappearing from, or should their range is shrinking. And, and we studied, uh, she studied them as, as part of her PhD um, studies in Sonora, Mexico, which is the f furthest northern distribution of them. Uh, real quickly, how do we study these kinds of, these broad ranging animals? Okay, we initially, in the good old days, used VHF, and we used handheld Yagi antennas. And whenever an animal decided to do this, we lost track of them, sometimes for days, sometimes for months, sometimes a year. Or if an animal did this, this was a, a, a GPS um, movement of a, of a mountain lion and her kitten, she, towards, just before she kicked this thing loose at uh, immigration age, she took, her, she took her kitten on this little jaunt. Um, only GPS could tell us that. If we had to fly that in Texas, we would not be able to have located this animal or knowing that she made this little exercise. Why did she do it? I have no idea. Maybe she was just kind of saying, hey, there's a bigger world out here. Um, you might want to uh, consider this area because I'm going to cut you loose. So. How do, we, how do we start with a, um, GPS technology? It's, it's advancing. It's still very cumbersome. It's still very heavy. You always hear about them tracking animals such as peregrine falcons with GPS, but those are, are, those are tags, PIT tags. We actually have to put our hands on an animal and um, place a collar on them. If you have a GPS collar that you're using that has an antenna like this, it won't last very long on an apex carnivore. I'm telling you right now, you need, ATS is currently um, internalizing these antennas. Here's a, a dispersing female in Texas that we followed with um, GPS. Uh, traveled all the way from the Davis Mountains, the Nature Conservancy property, where we were um, doing the collaring all the way to um, Interstate 10, and overlooked the interstate, sat there for a couple days, and turned around and came right back. That same animal then went down to Big Bend National Park, and within 100 meters of the park boundary was trapped, as were 16 other um, radio collared Texas animals that we were studying at that time. Because in Texas, mountain lions are considered vermin. They have no, no regulation whatsoever. You can drag a mountain lion down the streets of Texas behind your pickup truck, and no one would even look the other way. Uh, of course, highways also take their toe on them. This is the GPS animal that was killed. 
And when I gave this talk, I had an individual audience um, before I showed this slide. Well, hell, I even a mountain lion can cross the highway any time it wants to. But I can tell you that you to, to really realize what a mountain lion views a highway, you have to put a bag over your head and then run across it um, at night. We've had some animals actually starve to death because we had their, but we were able to find this because their moms were, were GPSed. We were also able to find den sites and more importantly, feeding sites, kill sites. This is what you need to do with your wolves. You need to characterize their, their diets and GPS collars allow you to do this. Once you uncover something like that, you find that you'll find out their prey. Sometimes we find scavenging events. Whoa, can you imagine that? If someone rode up on this and deci decided that a lion killed that cow? No, it, it fed on a month old dead cow. And at some of these sites, we actually place um, uh, trail cameras that have video capacity. Can you show that movie? We don't know if these things are gonna work until you press the button. But you can find that you can actually enter the world of the mountain lion or the wolf or whatever you want to with technology nowadays. We capture these animals we're using our cell phones. We monitor them with cell phone tower cameras. We know immediately when an animal is in a, in a, in a foot snare and um, we immediately respond. That's, that's the standards that we keep now. This, by that one picture at the end, we could tell that that animal was a, was a, was a female, a that, that kitten. Okay, I want to talk about three states that I've worked in recently, and um, all with natural prey. Okay, mountain lions are being eliminated in certain areas, or, or tempted to be, because of this animal here, desert bighorn sheep. Yvonne is a bighorn sheep disease specialist. She's written, uh, she's, publi she's published on diseases of bighorn sheep, and she will tell you that you need 189 bighorn sheep in a population for it to d survive a disease event, I guarantee you. All sheep populations experience disease events. I'm going to talk real quick about Arizona, Texas, New Mexico. In Arizona, they were flying, they were flying surveys on an annual basis and they detected this, a decline in, in sheep populations. These are the, these are the meta populations that um, we have for in Arizona of desert bighorn sheep. Next slide. Real quickly, just go through them. They would fly the surveys, they would determine the numbers, they would determine the recruitment. These are things you, that you have to do when you're managing um, ungulate populations. And associated prey. Next slide. In 2003, this is what started to show up in the Zarek Mountains of southwestern Arizona, extremely dry climate. There had never been a mountain lion recorded there for over 50 years. And all of a sudden at waters, man-made waters, this is what we started to see on camera. So we went in there and we, we thought we had one to two to three animals on like the Kofa National Wildlife Refuge. We collected scat, we ran DNA, we did a regression analysis, okay, that was statistically valid. On the, on the x-axis, you have the number of scat that you collect, and then on the y-axis, you have the, the number of individuals you, uh, you identify with um, DNA, and all of a sudden, you get this line that levels out, which tells you, based on about 100 scats, you've identified all the individuals that are out there in the environment as a minimum population size. You can do this with wolves or any other animal you want to, just by swabbing scat now. We've developed the techniques. It's published and GPS collars, because the two, the two have to go together. You have to know how animals are using the landscape, not just how many there are to affect your, your ungulates. And this can be done in Wisconsin, too. Does anybody see something that pops out at you at, from that picture? Just say it. What do you see? How about polygons? What do you see in the polygons? These are GPS recordings or movements of radio colored mountain lions. Every one that's been 73,000 locations, folks. What do you see there? 
Polygons represented by freeway systems. This is Arizona's freeway systems. 70, 73,000 locations and not one animal crossed a freeway, except in the upper left-hand corner, you see a red mark and a green mark going across the highway. That's because the road-killed animal was picked up on the other side of the highway and taken to somebody's house. We've never recorded a mountain cro lion crossing a busy interstate freeway. I'm not saying they don't do it, but the GPS animals have not, have not been recorded doing it. And in particular, in the southwest corner by Yuma, we realize that we have mountain lions that are trapped by freeways that then concentrate on the prey that's within that polygon. Next slide. So what are some other causes of prey? Um, declines, disease, disturbance, drought, predation, habitat fragmentation, which I just described. Um, the, we, we, we look at all these things, but what can a biologist do about any of this? Predation, we can kill, we can kill things. We can remove the predator, right? We can affect predation, we can affect mortality. It's easy to do. Next. I could train anybody in this room to kill every mountain lion in a polygon. So, when I was the large carnivore biologist, this is what we did. We, we said, okay, we're gonna kill mountain lions because that's what the sport hunting organizations want us to do. Not, I didn't say that all the hunters requested it. The sport hunting organizations demanded it. We knew that that would be publicly unacceptable. So we decided to come up with a collar and faller, and once we, an animal's killed two bighorn sheep, it would be removed from the population. That went all the way to the Ninth Circuit Court and was upheld as a viable, quote, management technique. So we removed the first alpha male. He, as far as we know from SCAT, at the time, he was the only male in, that, in this one unit. Oh, that, that lion killed, um, a bighorn sheep every 19 days. And so then it was replaced by mountain lion KMO2 and male MO3. Guess what we did? We increased the predation rate. We exasperated our problem. Duh. And if you can do the same thing with your wolf packs, if you want to, just remove your alpha male or female. You might be re it might be replaced by another sheep killer, okay? You have to be real careful about making these decisions. Next. Next. That red line represents what we need to maintain a desert bighorn sheep population in the Kofa National Wildlife Refuge. You have a really yearly recruitment. Your animals have to be replaced, correct? We had a mountain lion that was killing about 33 animals a year, so that the population was still increasing. And then as soon as we removed him, we increased the predation rate, and all of a sudden we put the, the decline into a steeper, steeper, um, much faster mode. Next. Why do we do this? Because this is the cost of restoration. These are the real costs that are currently going on right now in California to recover two bighorn sheep subpopulations. Next. This is what we did on the Kofa National Wildlife Refuge. This is your uh, National Wildlife Refuge. We stacked them up. Next. Okay, let's switch to Texas. This is what you can do in Texas year round. 24-7, and you don't have to check your traps. Like I said, we had 16 animals killed in Texas in our research there. It was almost futile to have a research project in Texas, but it really opened my eyes, okay? And these animals, I had one animal just stay in a trap for 16 days, okay? Next. Yes, Texas wanted, wants to kill mountain lions because of this. They have livestock depredation. Next. And they also raise a lot of deer there. That's, you know, they have a, hunt, a whole hunting business. And you have to be aware of the, of the business ecosystem that's in place, okay? Both 
livestock and wildlife. Next. Because deer is big business. Next. This is the study area. Huge area, huge landscape. You have to have huge landscapes. Next. We put radio collars on animals as young as this, VHF, then we switch to, to actual GPS later. Next. This is what we found. About 30, the, oh, we discovered the lions kill about, th they're eating about 30% 30 30 invasive species, feral hogs, all dads, elk. Those are all invasive species in Texas. How many livestock, how many cows, how many sheep, how many goats in trans pecos in two years killed any livestock? Nada, nothing, not one did we go to. This was 150 kill sites. They're now at 250. They still do not have one single cow. Okay, they do have a dead cow that I observed that was in the trapper's trap. The trapper caught a cow and it died as, due to exposure be, because it was left out there to catch a mountain lion. So tra actually, trappers have killed more cows in trans pecos than mountain lions have. Next. This is what we had. We actually found a new species in Texas, the quaddy, the Kuramunde. Okay, it was never known to be in the, in the Davis Mountains until we went to a kill site and found it. I'm currently working for a billionaire, not a millionaire, a billionaire who owns one million acres in New Mexico. Ted Turner, is, his business is wildlife. He expects his properties to make money and produce money. His fisheries alone makes over a million dollars. The ranch I'm working on, the, the ranch Armendaris, okay, has the largest desert, private desert bighorn sheep herd in the nation. 350 animals. The permits are $75,000. If anybody wants one in here, let me know afterwards. I'll, I'll try to get you one. Yeah, I'll put you on the waiting list, I promise you. So, to do that, we had to develop these. We had to develop six artificial waters by the state. Next. The first animal that showed up was this. Next. Oh, artificial waters. There's 1,000 artificial waters in the desert in Arizona developed by the Bighorn Sheep Society of Arizona. I'm telling you, we've changed the ecological dynamics of the desert with artificial water. Millions and millions of water, $10 million worth. Next. This is... These are all on trail cameras time after time. So what are we trying to do? We're going to deny water to mountain lions. Four months out of the year, we're going to close these suckers off, okay? And we're not going to allow anything to drink out of them because desert bighorn sheep don't need water four months out of the year at least. But mountain lions need water every single day of their lives, especially after they, they killed something. They've got, got to have water to digest protein. This has been the cost of raising a desert bighorn sheep herd where there were none before on the ranch I'm on. 45 mountain lions have been removed. Okay. So for what? So we can have six desert bighorn sheep permits a year? So someone could pay $75,000 a piece? Okay, condition taste aversion. I'm going to zip through this. This is aversive training, not condition taste aversion. Next. Okay, aversive training. Now, condition taste inversion. Since vets have walked out of Africa all the way across Beringia down to Mexico City, okay, we've used condition taste aversion to survive. Our vagus nerve, when you eat something that makes you ill, tells you you will not re eat that item, okay? Everybody here has, has experienced it. Next. I I experience every time I go to Mexico. Next, next, we won't. We're just going to real quickly show you how your nervous system is di is divided. Okay, it's called the vagus nerve. It's also responsible for your orgasm. Okay, that's how you remember it. I ask everybody in here how who's been food poisoned. Everybody would raise their hand if I asked how many people had sex. No one would raise their hand. Next. This is what we're doing today with the jaguar. It's the first time ever in Mexico. We're treating sheep meat. 
and then we're going to treat dog meat because we have a jaguar that's killing dogs and sheep. It's in captivity right now, and this is going to what we hope for. This is the pretreatment. This is what you do on day one. You feed it desert bighorn sheep or domestic sheep or human or whatever you want. If we can get the video to work. Day one is you treat it and it's got to be wrapped in a hide. It has to associate the smell and the taste, okay? And you can do this with wolves on a pack basis. They treat an entire Mexican wolf pack in, Mexi in Arizona to, to release. Of course, they haven't released it yet. Next. It's, we treat it with TBZ, thiabenzidol. It was discovered because they were feeding, a, they were deworming a wolf pup. It's a cattle, livestock dewormer. It's completely harmless, okay? It's, it, you can go to the EPA list. It's, it, you can buy it through a vet. It's a cattle dewormer. It makes, it, it does not give an animal convulsions. It does not poison them, okay? It strictly makes them go off and lay down and sit there like we would if we had food poisoning. That was the test two and six months after we treated the animal. The same response, that's it. It's, they will not eat desert bighorn sheep meat anymore. These are, this is what we hope to apply in, in a wild situation eventually. You can use it on your spouse if you want them to quit drinking, okay? You can use TBZ, seriously. Okay, Yvonne's turn. Yvonne's um, professor is Rodrigo Medellin. He's not responsible for releasing Chapo recently from prison in Mexico City. He's called the Batman of Mexico. He's, he's a bat specialist, but he also wrote the book Jaguar. And um, he's, he is her advisor. Um, thanks a lot for the invitation. Um, well, I'm going to go a little bit fast because we're running out of time. but. Uh, the other thing we have been working to try to reduce the conflict of uh, killing jaguars and pumas in retaliation of, uh, for them uh, killing livestock has been restoring prey, natural prey. So basically just uh, some of the literature that I had to make a review. And the, basically the main prey for pumas in most of the literature has been deer and for jaguar has been peccaries. So that's what uh, we wanted to focus on the area, on our study area to uh, restore. So uh, basically, this is what's happening in most of Mexico. We got the native prey is being poached illegally. So um, in some cases, there's very low numbers of native prey. Uh, same with deer. And then they put the cows over there. And then what happens is obviously they kill the cows. They lions and jaguars, and so what happens is that people just kill them, and I wish it was that way, but no, it's the other way. So uh, our objectives was first to estimate what was the abundance of deer and pecker in the area, also of calves, which would be the, also the uh, alternative prey, and then we want to increase that relative abundance, and then again, uh, measure what they were eating uh, before and after we increased the, the abundance of prey. So that's what we did, and for that, this is the place where uh, we're doing this, this uh, well, where we run this project. Uh, as you can see, it's you know, more like jaguar, puma habitat. Uh, also, Mexico think is for cow habitat. <laughs> so. This is our area, 7,000 hectares, and um, we place camera traps first to estimate all, all the abundance of the prey. That's more or less the distribution of the camera traps. 
And this is what we found in the first stage of the experiment. Uh, we have more cows than any, anything else. Of course, this is kind of a bias about um, we're putting the camera traps on places where we can detect pumas, lions, I mean pumas, jaguars, and calves as well, or any other uh, large mammal. So basically, we were detecting a very low uh, abundance of peccaries. Actually, we had more pictures of peccaries than of jaw. Uh, I mean, more pictures of jaguars than even of peccaries. So we were very low on peccaries. Um, so we captured some of the animals over there, radio colored them to follow them, what they were eating, and then we could establish uh, their diet before we did any changes on the environment. Uh, we uh, so. We knew what they were eating, then we translocated some peccaries. We couldn't really afford to bring deer, so we established it uh, to do it when it was going to be the uh, fawn season. Uh, plus, we placed some feeders just for the purpose of getting more density in the area to see what, what would happen with the calves present. So we call the peccaries once we release them. Uh, they kind of really like very much the feeders, so they stay there. Uh, more or less that was the area they stayed inside of our study area. And this is what we had on prey abundance before and after. We actually did increase the deer, mostly because of the fawns that were, uh, that were over there. And the calves more or less kept the same. And the peccaries, we also increased the, the abundance that we were registrating with the camera traps. And this is what we got about uh, with GPS kill sites once we were uh, investigating what they ate. The red one is what they ate um, after, and the blue one is what they ate before. So you can see that we increased the predation on deer, we increased a lot the predation on peccaries, and we decreased the livestock depredation. So we did a bunch of studies also with SCAT, and we had the same findings. We did decrease in both cases, uh, by skill site analysis and scat analysis, the calf predation. We also made some other measurements for the PhD, which is about selectivity of what is available. And it turns out that they do prefer peccaries over calves, and that didn't change. So if you think that, well, yeah, but maybe they were not enough time over there. No, actually, this is the first, the first phase of the study in which we got 17 kill sites inside of our study area. And in the second stage, we got 27 kill sites. We got more time of jaguars and lions with collars inside of the study area, but not killing uh, calves, but uh, killing more deer and peccaries. So basically, I know this is kind of a very logical thing to think, yeah, well, if they have more prey, they will eat more native prey. Uh, but we haven't really tested it right in the wild. So that's what we did, test it, you know, change and put more native prey, restore that native prey, and yeah, of course, they prefer the native prey, and you can reduce livestock depredation. So our other thing was then to tell about these results to all the community, starting from uh, biologists of the local university, which are the sons of the ranchers, <laughs> and with all the ranchers that uh, have um, their, their farms over there, and um, all the community around it, just to tell them about these results, and obviously they were confirming, yeah, yeah, well, no, those, my neighbor that has more peccaries has less depredation on, on the livestock. So it was really nice to uh, interact with them and you know, uh, show them that science can also help on that. We also invited some of the ranchers to some of the captures to interact also with them, and so they could see you know, lions in another perspective. And <laughs> we're basically still working with ranchers, uh, which we believe is the way also to change things with them and show them how to coexist with wildlife without taking uh, lethal methods, which obviously are illegal in Mexico, but they still do it. So, um, unfortunately, this is the, uh, how our jaguar female ended uh, for some guy that was poisoning, and then they burn it. Like I said, it's illegal in Mexico laws. Um, can actually punish someone for killing a jaguar for eight to 10 years of prison. But this has never happened. See, in Mexico, we got a problem about uh, reinforcement of law. Many people do not really follow the laws, and there's a lack of uh, reinforcement of law. Uh, so basically, they do whatever they want. But government is actually trying always to protect wildlife, which is 
What I have seen and confirmed here is kind of different. People do want to protect wildlife and your government tries to kill them. <laughs> so basically, same, same results, but different, <laughs> different approaches. We're also trying to work with uh, levels of politicians, which has been very interesting with you guys hearing all, all of this, because uh, we're actually trying to change laws as well in the Congress to try to get an intersectoral committee that is formed by people from the different sectors of the government, but also from society and from academics, which would be the scientists, to actually uh, change a few things that we have been observing with wildlife and with cattle management in Mexico. So basically it's that, and that's the end of the tale. Uh, oh, thank you guys, that was excellent. Yes, does anyone have any questions? Good. <laughs> the southern area of the United States has a really big problem with um, the pigs, the, um, the, yeah, the wild ones, the wild ones. Are you seeing an influx as well of those um, animals into Mexico by chance? Wild, wild boars, yes. What? Yeah, Yeah. Mexico, they've entered Mexico, um, of course, just south of Texas, because that's where the wild boars were originally released. They're, uh, they're, they're threatening a multi-million dollar agribusiness. Again, you have to be aware of the, the, the business ecosystem. And um, it, will that save more mountain lions? No, probably it, it won't in that respect. But you, we do have uh, uh, some good data that says, hey, 15% of diet of mountain lions, at least in Texas, are wild boars. They do not eat the big wild boars. They do not attack male wild boars where the tusks are more prominent. They assess that risk. They will not touch them, okay? I can go to lots of wild boar kills and they're off young adults or, or even the females, okay? No problem. And of course, they prefer peccaries. That's the perfect size of animals. So yeah, I'm sorry, the wild boars are in 32 states now, I believe, according to the Smithsonian report. Um, they're gonna be in every state soon. So gear up for it. <laughs> Mountain lions and wild boars are coming, Wisconsin. Western and Western Canada. I read that uh, wild boars are really good for the forest regeneration, which deer are not, by, because they root around and that helps plant, replant forests. Um, I also heard that wild boars are really good herders. So, I mean, can we find some human use for these guys? Yeah, there's, there's good studies, good science-based, good science scientific method used, okay, to, to study diets of wild boars. They eat every damn acorn that hits the ground, folks, okay? They're just like vacuum cleaners. No more wild mast. They'll clean it up. Okay, I, where I worked in Texas, it was on um, one ranch alone, they went in and removed 1,100 wild feral pigs, okay? You're talking... You know, a couple litters a year, 16, you know, 12 to 16 animals a litter. Folks, their reproductive potential is unbelievable. And talk about diseases, H1N1, whatever, whatever you want. They've got it. They really do. They're nasty, okay? Um, and again, they, they do attack pets at the same rate that um, bears might attack dogs. You think you're going to be paying, you know, you're not going to have to worry about bears once wild boars enter Wisconsin. I have a question for you. What is the estimated population of jaguars in Mexico now? I know when I went to New Mexico State, we had one female that kept coming through the heel of the wilderness, didn't want to stay, and kept going back home. I'm just wondering, what is there an estimate there? And, and are they on in like an endangered species list for Mexico? And is the mountain lion also on, on a protected list? Yeah, both of them are on protected list. Like Ron mentioned, they do need a permit for hunting whatever in Mexico. So uh, jaguars, uh, there's a recent uh, survey that they did with camera traps and we estimated 3,800 jaguars in 2010. Uh, I believe that much, uh, that might be lower this year. Uh, and well, the thing is that those mostly are in the south of Mexico. So that's why you get just a few <laughs> going to the 
uh, northern. Uh, in Sonora, uh, I wouldn't think there are more like, maybe not more than 200, right? Maybe, maybe less. So yeah, basically it's more or less like that. And um, yeah. I just remember that because we caught one on a camera trap for a Mexican gray wolf. We were like, yeah, oh my God. and, and uh, well, I mean, we have some camera data running since 2009 to 2013. There's a publishing, a, publish, uh, a paper coming about that. Uh, we detected a decline on the population in Sonora in those areas from 87% in only four years. Because, you know, there's still a lot of killing yeah, illegally. And we don't know about mountain lions how many they are, but they are protected because we don't know how many they are. <laughs> and um, got any more questions? One question? All right. So when you're doing the aversion where you're um, turning them against that, do you ever go the next step of trying to eliminate the chase response by moving it? So you know what I mean where uh, a predator, if something runs, it has a chase response. And I'm just wondering if you take the next step and try and move it. Yeah, they were talking about a cursorial hunting animal versus an ambush animal. And, and that's, you know, that's a very good distinctive um, thing we need to talk about because mountain lions and jaguars are ambush animals, whereas you know, wolves are cursorial. Uh, Gustafsson did the original um, condition taste aversion with lithium chloride with wolves, okay? And it, the prey actually becomes dominant. So they will actually chase an animal and then go, whoa, that thing smells like something that just made me really sick and then back off to the point that they'll, they'll run up again, smell it, and back off. We have a video of that, if you'd like to see it, I have it on my computer. And then the prey, the sheep, the sheep becomes the dominant and starts chasing the wolves around the pen. We have that. So and it, they do, they will, I think, chase it initially until they realize that thing is really something I don't want to finish killing, okay? Now, we, it's been yet, we, we still don't quite know if a, if a puma or a mountain lion will kill an animal and go, oh, I killed the wrong thing because it's that quick, they're that quick. I do have, I did treat a, a Texas um, wild animal with a GPS collar, and um, what it did was it stayed in that mountain range, the mountain range of desert big and sheep for about a week, and then it just left the mountain range and never came back. It decided it can't, you, it can't survive in that mountain range, I think, without um, you know, eating um, bighorn sheep. So it went to another mountain range where it ate. And then we were kicked off the ranch because the desert, the sheep society put out the word, hey, you catch a mountain lion, it's dead. We don't, wanna, you know, we don't want to be testing condition taste aversion in Texas. If you want, if you want pr sheep on your private land, your ranch, this is the real deal. I went. I, I had to go talk to 30 landowners about how to get desert big sheep on their property. And after I gave this talk, the Texas Parks and Wildlife got up and said, "We have a 100-point system, and to get 10 of those points, you have to kill mountain lions. To get another 10 points, you have to develop water to get the point. And if you don't have 90 per points, you will never get big sheep on your private property in Texas." That's a real deal. But I did have one landowner who had sheep already come up and say, hey, I'd like to try test um, CTA. And that's where we went to. But then he came and said, sorry, Ron, we're done because they will not issue us permits now unless we kill mountain lions. I'm sorry, it's, in, it's, it's embedded, okay? It's part of the system. And if you're talking fifty to $75,000 permit, you're back in the business ecosystem. Like Daryl was talking about this morning, you have to be aware, you have to be, no economics, you have to compete with it. And as Ted Turner said, if you want to do good for wildlife, go out and make lots of money and then spend it on wildlife. <laughs> All right, I think that that wraps it up. Thank you. <laughs>